Was I? Um, yes, so it's my very great pleasure to introduce the first of this evening's sessions, both of them dedicated to photographers. The first one, Peter Rauter, son of Ferdinand and Claire Rauter, and brother of Andrea Rauter, who is really very much the, the sort of star of this evening's um, uh, presentation, the sort of centerpiece, if you like. Um, so without further ado, just actually, I will just say, please, yes, keep yourselves muted for the moment. There will be time for questions afterwards. Uh, I would urge you, given the numbers, to type them in through the chat function, which I'm sure most of you by now are well aware, um, is at the bottom, yes, the bottom center of everybody's screen. And if it seems appropriate, then I will ask you to unmute yourselves to ask the questions. We'll just see, play that one slightly by ear. But in the first instance, please do just type in any comments and questions you may have. So briefly to introduce our speakers, our participants today, um, Andrea Rauter, first of all. She worked as a teacher in mainstream as well as special needs education until 1996. And while teaching, she simultaneously initiated a number of EU-wide educational projects. From 1996 to 2011, she worked as music and special projects manager for the Austrian Cultural Forum in London, where she project led various rather wonderful festivals, including the Austrian Jewish Cultural Festival in tandem with the Jewish, Jewish Music Institute. Since then, Andrea has continued working as an independent project manager and is on the board of the Anglo-Austrian Music Society and is a trustee also of the Cosman Keller Art and Music Trust. And we will hear, I think, from Daniel Sloman something about the wonderful Milan Cosman as well later on. Uh, then we have Alex Schneiderman, who is a very special contributor because he worked, he actually worked with Peter and has, will be able to give us insights into the way he, he set about his portrait series, that wonderful Immigrants of Influence uh, uh, photographic portrait series that is very much the focal point of our session today. Um, he worked with Peter in the 1990s, early 1990s as his assistant and became a very great and close personal friend of him of his. He continued to work both as a printer for other photographers and as a documentary photographer himself and still indeed does so. And a year or so ago he set up a gallery in Kensal Green called Flow Photographic Gallery which specializes I understand in British documentary photography. I must also mention Ian Lillycrap, who's going to be, we can probably see him there on, this, on your screens, he's going to operate behind the scenes, um, making sure that the images get presented uh, seamlessly and smoothly, so thank you Ian for that. He's a freelance photographer, uh, until fairly recently associated with the Jewish Museum in, in London, but essentially a freelance photographer who's worked in the cultural heritage sector for more than 20 years. And lastly, we'll be hearing from cultural historian Daniel Snowman, and I will say again, Daniel, I've said this before, as the project consultant to Insiders Outsiders, you've been an absolute mainstay and tremendous help and I'm terribly grateful to you for that. Uh, he uh, was born in London and a lecturer at the University of Sussex before working at the BBC, where he produced a wide variety of projects on historical and uh, cultural topics. Uh, he's a senior research fellow at the Institute of Historical Research at the University of London, and his many books include most relevant, of course, for us today, The Hitler Emigres, The Cultural Impact on Britain of Refugees from Nazism. And if you haven't yet read it, it was reprinted, wasn't it, Daniel, sort of more recently, very readable, a mine of information, do I urge you to read it. Um, he was also the author of the introduction to the companion volume to the Insiders Outsiders Festival, which focuses specifically on the visual arts, including photography, uh, published by Lund Humphreys last year. Right, enough, I think, by way of preamble, over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Monica. Peter Rauter was a freelance, highly regarded photographer in advertising and editorial, as well as in any other areas, in, in, both in the UK and abroad. His book with Hugh Landau on English country cottages is still available. He started his career as the photographer Donovan's assistant after attending the London College of Printing. Peter died suddenly and totally unexpectedly at the age of 56 at his home, family home in France, leaving behind his wonderful wife, Rebecca, and two very little girls, Zilla and Raffaella, both who have grown into the most beautiful, creative, resourceful young ladies of whom Peter would be proud. I'm very grateful to Monica, Ian, Alex and Daniel for helping me on this journey of rediscovery. My brother Peter was 16 months younger than I, and we grew up in the top flat of 74 Carlton Hill in the very happiest of families. 
This family of four was augmented much of the time by a wonderful extended family of friends, most of whom in the early years, like my parents, come from Central Europe. My father was a wonderfully creative cook, creative cook and cooked with whatever was available for whoever happened to be with us at the time. Everyone mucked in with setting the table and washing up. My mother, the perfect, if often exhausted hostess, was much younger than daddy, very beautiful and adored by all, including her staff at Primrose Hill Infant School, where she became a highly revered headmistress. Many of Peter's portrait sitters were close family friends and Frieda von Hofmannsthal, who was like a granny to us, lived on the ground floor where she entertained the aristocracy of Central Europe in her tiny flat. She was the wid widow of Richard von Hofmannsthal, the cousin of Hugo. Hofindag, as we called her, because we could not pronounce Hofmannsthal, came from a very prestigious and cultured family in Vienna. She never lost her dignity, as well as high standards of behavior and etiquette, despite near poverty and the traumas she had been forced to live through. Daddy first met Norbert Reining in Priest Heath internment camp and introduced him to Peter Shidloff there. Norbert became the first violinist of the Amadeus Quartet and Peter, or Hans as we called him then, became the violist. Both stayed lifelong friends with our family and spent many happy hours in Carlton Hill, rehearsing, playing, eating, and Norbert telling jokes. You can see his ebullient humor from Peter's portrait. He was the best teller of jokes and I was determined to at least remember some of them, but alas, of course, I didn't. Dr. Strauss came from Vienna with Freud as his doctor and became a highly regarded pediatrician. She was our kind, if at times slightly um, intimidating, childhood doctor. Martin Isep, the internationally renowned pianist, teacher and accompanist, was the son of the famous singer and teacher Heli, Helene Isep, and of Sebastian, the art restorer. Heli was the teacher of Janet Baker, and it was through her that Janet came to work with my father. I remember beautiful and peaceful Christmas evenings at the Isep's home. Martin's father was the only other friend of daddy's from his hometown in Corinthia. Gustav Del Banco, co-founder of the Roland Browse and Del Banco Art Gallery, and his family were close and had been very supportive friends of daddy immediately after his leaving internment and stayed friends all their lives. I remember as a child going up that staircase behind there to his grandma, his elegant and very awe-inspiring mother, always dressed in black. But the better bit was going to the cocktail parties as a late teenager, trying very unsuccessfully to hold a glass, a handbag and shape hands and still look dignified, very difficult. The artist, Puck Hugo Dachinger and his brother had apparently known my mother as children when they used to meet on holiday in Altaussee. My father got to know him in the internment camp in Morag on the Isle of Man, and they renewed a warm friendship not long before daddy's death in 1997, sorry, 87. Puck could regularly be seen in his favorite coffee house, the then Dome in Hampstead, where he sat for hours drawing the clientele. I have one of his pictures from the Morag internment camp hanging above my desk and I treasure it. Paul or Paul Hamburger was another lifelong friend who daddy first met in Morag internment camp where they played duets and chamber music together together with Peter Gellhorn and others. Paul, like many young men, adored my mother. But when daddy arrived on the scene, he apparently said, boys, you can all go home now because Rauta has arrived. Despite this, he coached mummy in harmony and helped her through her LRAM. When I first started working at the Austrian Cultural Forum, it was to Paul at the time teaching at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama 
to whom I turned to find young musicians of talent for our new artist series. I remember Marie-Louise von Motyshitsky, who was a great friend of my father's musical partner, the singer Engel Lund, coming occasionally with Elias Canetti to ask for supper. I thought she was very beautiful, but he rather frightened me with his bushy eyebrows and frighteningly piercing ears, eyes. When Marie-Louise's eyesight failed, Mum used to go around on a weekly basis to read to her. In 2006, on the anniversary of her death, Norbert Mein and his students from the Royal College of Music gave a beautiful and moving memorial concert of Daddy and Engelund's folk songs in her local church in Hampstead. Heidi Stadlin and her husband, the pianist and music critic Peter Stadlin, lived in Hampstead. After finishing her studies at the feet of Wittgenstein in Cambridge, as she used to say to me, she and her then husband left for Ceylon, where they founded the Communist Party together. On her return, she married the Peterstadt Lane. She was for me the most beautiful lady, alongside Mummy's foster mother, the film star Constance Cummings. I kept in touch with Heidi literally to the day of her death. This photographic project started with Daddy taking a photo of Peter and then Peter taking one of Daddy. My father was a pianist and music therapist. He had a musical partnership for over 30 years with the Danish singer Engel Lund, for whom he set folk song texts. After his release from internment, he was instrumental in bringing the Amadeus Quartet together and he joined Vaughan Williams on the Committee for the Release of Interned Alien Musicians. He co-founded the Anglo-Austrian Music Society and worked tirelessly, really tirelessly, to bring understanding between the two countries. I will now read Peter's statement that he wrote um, when he did this project. This is what he said, I quote, this project came about having worked professionally for many years in the fields of advertising and editorial photography. It occurred to me that in all these years, I had never taken photographs which honored my family's emigrant Austrian heritage. As an artist in search of a subject, I began recording a chapter in the history which could never and should never be forgotten. My mother came from a Jewish family in Vienna and came to London on the Kindertransport, later to become a teacher and head of Primrose Hill Infant School. My father, an Austrian from Klagenfurt, but not Jewish, chose to come to England. A musician, he gave concerts throughout Europe and the United States, promoted music as a therapy, and also found time to enjoy his other great loves of mushrooming and wildflowers. My parents settled in St. John's Wood, where over the years I met a good many of their friends, some of whom were the inspiration and subject of this portfolio. You can see them all on screen. Josephine Strauss, soulmate of Anna Freud and family doctor, Marie-Louise von Motyshitsky, the uncompromising portrait painter and friend of Elias Canetti and Oskar Kokoschka, Sir Ernst Gombrich, art historian, lecturer and author of World Renown diminutive Hugo Puckdachinger, painter and cartoonist, whose materials being limited to mud, coal, human hair and newspapers, managed to record the miseries of the internment on the Isle of Man. Peter Roth, who became the principal of the first Camp Hill village for the disabled and was awarded the OBE for his services. Frieda von Hofmannsthal, widow of Hugo's cousin, living a life of old Viennese nobility and style in her tiny North London apartment, surrounded by her few remaining possessions. Gustav Del Banco, founder of the Del Banco Browse Gallery, one of the first West End galleries to exhibit works of contemporary artists. Bettina Adler, painter and sculptor, and widow of H.C. Adler, whose account of the life in the Theresienstadt concentration camps became a classic. I have not attempted to include biographical details, 
as one quality is common to all the subjects. They had to leave home, they've come to England, and they've made their mark. To these people, I dedicate my work, Peter Rauter, November 1996. The original exhibition was awarded the Silver AFAB Award in 1993. It had subsequent showings at the Belzai Park Club 43 as part of the Austrian Jewish Festival, the Tabernacle in Notting Hill Gate, the Austrian Cultural Forum, and the Freud and Jewish Museums. I will now ask the photographer and dear friend and master printer Alex Schneidemann, who is Peter's assistant at the time of the portraits were taken, to talk about Peter's work. Over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, and it really is um, an honour for me to be talking today about Peter because he was such an important figure in my life. Um, I thought I would, <laughs> um, I, I thought I'd give you the um, un, maybe the unauthorised version, as it were, of Peter. Because as a very young photographer, I think I worked with Peter from about ninety-one to ninety-four, and then further. Uh, than that because um, he was moving around the world and had moved to Turkey and and had gone on to other things. But uh, he was uh, an extraordinary character. He was an extraordinary person, Peter. I mean, he was a magnet for people and everybody loved being around him. Um, I was very fortunate to be taken on in his studio, which was in, just off uh, the Belsize Park Road, a uh, beautiful studio on the top floor of an old stable block, um, absolutely enormous, impossible to imagine such a thing now, really. Um, and in, um, I, I, when I started working there, people would come in and out constantly. I mean, people, I, I had no idea who they were, but they, they were all people from a, you know, cult, you know cultural and uh, to my sort of very young eyes of sort of immense sort of, uh, uh, you know, achievement and, and cultural importance and so on. And Peter would get, greet them all warmly. With, and we constantly were cooking and wine would be had at lunch. This was not your average photographic studio in London at the time. There was a grand piano in, uh, in one corner which would be wheeled out constantly for recitals and people would uh, come from far and wide to Peter's studio for, uh, for recitals by visiting trios and, and, and solo, you know, soloists. It was an extraordinary place. And Peter himself was an extraordinary person. He spoke many languages. He could play the piano, although he, I think he never really appreciated his own talent at it. He was a, uh, he was a great cook. Uh, he was very clever, very clever. And I think this is something that people don't always understand about Peter. Peter had one of the sharpest minds that I've ever come across. He was an extraordinary uh, man, really. And he grasped things very quickly. And in fact, he grasped ideas and disposed of them before most people had even uh, started to talk. And it could be an exhausting uh, joust with Peter, um, but, but always good. And he, his, I mean, his knowledge of uh, photography was prodigious, of course. He knew no fear. This is something that's important to put down on the record, I'm sure Andy will attest to this, that he knew no fear. He, he would climb anything, do anything, and the, and the bigger and more challenging something was, a project was, a photo photographic project, the more he wanted to be part of it. Um, so life in the studio was always interesting. Um, Peter, I should say, trained as Terence Donovan's assistant, and that was sort of a, a gold entry into the world of advertising. And in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, London was at the very epicenter of that kind of photography, that large-scale, glamorous, big-budget, international photography. And Peter was at the very height of that. So, during, so, so but Peter had, when I started to work for Peter, he was beginning to wind down from that. He was looking to make films. He was looking for other projects, in fact. And I think that this, the, the portraits he, that we're looking at this evening were very much a product of his restless mind. In fact, looking for the next thing and looking at, at the same time of paying some kind of homage to people who he had known all his life, as Andrea just said, and, um, and, and 
wanted to memorialize in some way and to play his part in their story. Um, so uh, Peter was, a, at that time, to be a photographer of, of Peter's standard, you had to be a real craftsman. I mean, there, there was, uh, everything was obviously still film. Uh, Peter worked in 5, 4, 10, 8, uh, and uh, all, the, all the formats. And in fact, these uh, pictures were taken on a Mamiya RB, which Peter absolutely loved. And um, I'll talk and maybe a touch a little bit more on the technical side of things in a minute. Uh, Peter's use of lighting was legendary. I mean, that's what he was really known for in the photographic community. He was, uh, every, he was, he was a photographer's photographer, uh, it, it, but, but it was his lighting that he had an extraordinary uh, power over. He, he could draw lighting, and I think this picture that we're looking at of uh, Mary Louise von Matuszewski um, is one of them, because that was entirely artificially lit, but it looks entirely natural. And um, he, he just could, he knew what to do wherever he was. I was an extremely poor assistant. I made mistakes continually, and I will touch again on that again. I, I turned up at, um, it was at Peter Rotz, and I'd forgotten all the film. I've done, I've, I've done many, many terrible things which Peter put up with, but he was a scary boss, I've got to say. I mean, other photographers gave, and other assistants would give you credit if you'd worked for Peter, because he was an absolute taskmaster, and we'd work often through the night, uh, and he, he had a prodigious capacity to work. He also had a prodigious capacity to balance that work with drinking wine, which we would do constantly and, and smoke a lot as well. So it was, it was never not fun with Peter. Um, he would travel all over the world to glamorous projects and um, and, and what, one of the things about his, his love of lighting or his gift of, with lighting was his, also his gift with color, which people um, w w would also remark on. And, and this was extraordinary because Peter was colorblind. So he, he didn't see color as other people see it. So that may have given him an advantage in a way, but he knew that there were certain reds, you know, certain shades of red that he couldn't pick up. And that was, and, but, but, his, but his ability to pick color out. And I remember him saying to me once that it's impossible to tell the difference between dawn and dusk in a photograph. And I don't know if you've ever tried, but it is genuinely very difficult. And I've never heard anybody remark on that before. Um, you'd think it would be obvious, but it's actually not. Um, he would, so, so making, uh, so going, turning to his actual, um, I'm looking at my notes here because <laughs> I'm not used to this, but, but turning to, to the, um, to the actual, the shoots, and I was present for, I think about 10 or 11 of them. Um, they would, they would never be the same. I mean, Peter was mostly interested in people. I think that photography for him was a way of making connections with people. And I think that he really, more than anything, he loved to talk to the people. And, uh, and I remember um, meeting Bettina Adler. Um, I, I, it, it, it was, I felt ter terribly sort of uh, like a, uh, uh, like I felt like an intruder into the lives of these extraordinary, um, uh, well-traveled, uh, accomplished musicians, writers, and so on. And I, I l would watch aghast, well, not aghast, I mean, uh, amazed as Peter would just light straight into them. I mean, he, there was not a touch of obs obsequy in, in, in Peter. He was a straight talker. If he didn't think something was right, it didn't matter who he was talking to, he would take them on. And they always took it from Peter because he did it with such intelligence and charm. So after about a good hour of chat, during which time I'd be putting up the lights, if, if, if most of them were lit um, by, by Peter, which became sort of unfashionable later. But I think when you look at these portraits, I can now see with 21st century eyes, if you see in somebody who works in the business, that there is a sort of quality to this that you just don't get, um, very, you, don't, you don't see very often these days. And Peter would set up his, lens, his, his camera, usually on a tripod, which is also unusual now. And he would get, uh, he would engage the, uh, the, the sitter in conversation. The conversation just wouldn't stop. And it would be a bit like a, 
um, I don't know, a, a dentist or, or somebody trying to distract you before doing something really painful. And Peter would just chat and ch chat and click. And, and I'd feed him rolls of film as he chatted and clicked. And this would go on uh, until suddenly the shoot was over. The, per the, the sitter hadn't even noticed. And it had all been incredibly good fun. In fact, I don't remember any of them being at all difficult. I, um, I think that I think that the, the shoot of Von der Newby, uh, the picture that you see, shows some pain on her face because I think that she was the only one who didn't understand living in the country and being dis sort of disconnected from the sort of cultural London life and the hurly burly. That she was the only one who found it harder to uh, to, to 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 relax and uh, and so on. And whenever I look at that picture, I remember the sort of cold day and the desperation to find a good shot but I but Peter did and it was quite in incredible um, I wanted to talk about in particular about Gombrich um, the, 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 the session with Gombrich was um, was was totally memorable uh, for me um, I knew I, I mean I knew who Ernst Gombrich was but I was no expert on him and we went I remember we went not far from it was only sort of five minutes around the corner from Peter's studio to Gombrich's flat uh, in Finchley Road, or off the Finchley Road. I mean, I'm sure somebody can correct me on that. And um, and it was, I remember us going in, and there was a there was a sort of hush. There were there were very, there were people there, and uh, and we were told to wait because Gombrich was having a massage. And in the side of the room, my first view of Gombrich was him lying on a table being massaged. And this was apparently a daily um, a daily occurrence. And he was quite stricken in years, but, but he uh, uh, very quickly uh, got himself together and, um, and it was all sort of completely normal, his, his nurse, was, it was, and during, during this time, Peter chatted to them, chatted in German, chatted, you know, and again, Peter's amazing ability to communicate with anybody, um, anybody in the room, I mean, there must have been sort of four or five people in the room. Uh, or, or I had no idea who they were, but it was clear that this was Gombrich's life, surrounded by people being given daily massages on tables and so forth. Um, and presently, P uh, Peter got to talk, we, we got to photographing Gombrich. And the thing about Gombrich, th this picture is it's different from many of the other pictures because in many of the other pictures, Peter has positioned the sitter in their environment. But in Gombrich's case, he's removed him entirely from his environment. And more than that, and this is very unusual for all of the pictures, he's cropped it and he's tilted it. And I know that there's another shot of Gombrich, which is the original shot. And it's all about that hair on Gombrich's nose. It's, it's just, it's just, it just brings you in. But there is this extraordinary, it's, a, it's the most vigorous portrait of a man full of life. And I think, and Peter was totally instinctive in the way that he treated his subjects and in the way that he treated the prints, the making of the prints later. Um, Gombrich, another thing I'd just like to mention about Gombrich's house is that during the time that we were waiting for Gombrich to, to you know, for his um, morning manipulation, um, he, I looked around his flat and, and I was very surprised, surprised to see there were, there were no, uh, pictures hanging on the wall and uh, I can see and and uh, and I'm just wondering if there is but there was one picture that I found in the hallway which was a photograph a print by Henri Cartier-Bresson now and I'm um, upset I mean I as a, obviously many people who found, find themselves in photography were obsessed with Cartier-Bresson and it was a picture I'd never seen before but it is simply one of the most beautiful pictures it, that I've seen of his. It was, it was of a duck on a pond at dusk or perhaps dawn. We can't tell, and particularly in black and white. And, and it's absolutely stunning. And the, I wrote to the collector, Eric Frank, um, who was Martin Frank's brother, and the, who was and Martin Frank being the wife of Cartier-Bresson, to see if he could tell me uh, and Eric is a, the world expert in Cartier-Bresson, to see if he could identify that picture. All I know about it is that the two most important things about it to me was it was the only picture that Gombrich had on his house and that it was given to him for writing the foreword to uh, an exhibition catalogue. 
for Cartier Bresson. Um, so, uh, would, so, so the prints that we made, Peter photographed on, uh, as I mentioned before, Mamiya RBs with um, uh, various lenses, and the, the, the Mamiya lenses are, 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 are the best in the world. I mean, they're, they're still the best, and, um, and, they st and people still love the camera for that reason. And he would shoot usually on uh, Kodak Plus X film, and we'd process it in deep tanks, and then we'd make prints. And the original, and I'd like to know this, and maybe um, somebody will tell us, but the, the original prints were lith prints, and which are, which are, a, which are a curious way of making a print, because you make a print in two different developers, and unlike normal printing, where, you, where it just comes to the end of its process development, it, in a lith print, you judge it under dark conditions, um, under dim conditions, I should say, and then pull it into the next bath. And so no two prints are ever the same, but they have these extraordinary t textural quality. And uh, I often wonder what happened to those prints because they were absolutely stunning. And I worked next, you know, side by side with Peter, um, uh, making those prints and I it's an experience that I've never forgotten and I know I'll never uh, I'll never have again but, but it was it was a wonderful form you know f foundation in photography working for Peter I'd like to leave you with a story that um, I told Andy uh, Andrea uh, today and I got permission to tell it because uh, it's, it's something <laughs> that Peter told me um, and um, one, after one of many mess ups that I had made, and I'd give them a much stronger turn, um, but uh, you know, uh, Peter t explained to me one of his, it, it told me about one of his greatest, uh, prob no, it would be his greatest mistake whilst working for Donovan. He, um, Donovan, Terence Donovan, had been given the uh, commission to photograph Ted Heath then Prime Minister, and this was a massive accolade for Terence Donovan, East End born, star of his profession, star of, you know, of the London fashion scene, um, and a man about town, and the man made good. And off uh, Peter and, and Terence went to number 10 to photograph, uh, uh, to photograph Ted Heath, and and it all went incredibly well. And Peter, just as he would do with me later, sent me back to the studio, or sent, in this case, Terence, sent Peter back to the studio to process the film. And, uh, and, and in those days, we used to process in these things called deep tanks where you'd, you'd have rolls of film and you'd put them into cages and you'd have four tanks in a row, the first dev, stop, fix, wash, and in they go to the, to the, to the, to the dev. And you had to be really careful that you, because you, you could put a lid on and turn the lights on. Um, what between sort of agitations and for people who know about these things. And, um, but you had to be really careful that you put the light on and you, you, you know, in, in those days we'd, we'd, put the, we'd, we'd put the cover on, turn on the light and light a cigarette and wait for the next agitation or whatever. Peter didn't put the lid on and turn the light on and we know what happens to film when that happens, and it was still in the developer. So he pulled, he quickly got the, the, the lid back on, and this is Peter telling me this, and, and um, I'm pretty sure he didn't do it, and, and, uh, and, and, and using his cool head, and I gotta say, I'm not sure what I would have done in, in this moment. I think this is what this story illustrates very much what Peter is, what the essence of Peter. He didn't panic. He put the, 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 the lid back on and finished the process as normal of the film. Afterwards, he found that, all, that almost all the film was ruined, but he was able to salvage 10 exposures from it, which over the course of many, many hours in the darkroom, he cut into individual bits of film. He then printed those as 10 different contact sheets in 10 different arrangements and presented them to Terence Donovan the next morning. And Terence didn't notice, and nor did anybody else. And Peter got away with it, which, is, I, which I think says more about, um, about Peter than anything. I mean, it, it is his, his mastery of the medium, of course, but his completely brilliant ability to think his way through any problem. And, um, 
I think I'll I'll leave it there, if I may. And uh, and uh, and I I mean I I just like to end it by saying that I miss Peter every day. We were such great friends, and um, and I'm so pleased to have been part of this. So thank you very much. And over to you, Ian. Uh, Daniel, if you'd like to take over, screen share. Yep, very happy to do so. Okay. Um, thank you, and, and thank you for that, Alex. Most interesting. Um, I'm going to pick up from some of what we've already heard from Alex and from Andrea and talk in particular about three people whom Peter photographed, not only those three, but three in particular, and some of them have been mentioned already. And they're in three different kind of cultural areas. Music, and I'll talk about Norbert Brynen and the Amadeus and his, some of his friends. Drama, we saw a picture of Martin Estlin, who among other things was head of BBC Radio Drama when I was there. And art and art history, and we've just been hearing about uh, <laughs> Gombrich and his nasal hair and all the rest of it. And I'll say a little bit about him, his work, the Warburg Institute, and so on. So let me um, start with the images. And there's jolly Norbert Breinin, uh, born in Vienna in 1923. Uh, died in London, uh, he was just over 80. All the people I'm talking about, by the way, and I get a lot of personal warmth from knowing this, lived to be well, well over 80. Norbert, um, the great, the, the leader of the Amadeus Quartet, um, a powerful figure, a, quite a character. There's a drawing of the Amadeus Quartet on the right way by Miline Cosman. Uh, the wife, late, the widow of, of, of um, we'll, we'll come back to her and her, her family and Hans Keller and so on later on. There's, there's Norbert on the left, the leader of the quartet. Ziggy Nissel, the, the second violinist, Peter Shidloff, all three of them refugees from Vienna. And the cellist Martin Lovett on the right, who only died very, very recently and was, uh, was of course, British born. Norbert was a character. He was a big fella, uh, powerful personality, expressed himself very, very strongly. There is another uh, Miline uh, drawing of him. I used to think of him as the benevolent Buddha. He, there was a kind of gentleness to him. There was a benevolence to him. But my God, I, you know, I sat in on a lot of rehearsals, knew them extremely well. And Norbert would say, no, 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 we need to do it much more like this. And then he'd illustrate what he was doing on his violin. And there'd be a lot of rubato and a lot of vibrato. And then Nissel or Shidloff, having some doubts, would say, well, that's a good idea, Norbert. Let's try it. I'm not sure. Whether, let's see. Let's do the whole movement and put that into it. So, and Norbert, um, you couldn't really stop him. He could be difficult. He could be very opinionated. Um, yes, as we heard earlier, he told lots and lots of jokes. Um, I do, unlike Andrea, I do remember some of them, but it's, this is not the occasion in which to repeat some of them, I have to say. I remember having a dinner with the Amadeus after they'd been recording in Munich, uh, doing, among other things, the Verdi Quartet, interestingly, and all very serious all day long, and they'd been doing some Mozart. But at dinner that night, we all drank a little bit, and the witty ruderies were, um, well, both of those things. Um, Norbert was um, brought up in Vienna. Father died quite young. He's brought up by his uncles. And you see him, top left picture there. He's the, the one on the left. You can just about make it out. And uh, his family, they were sort of Polish Jewish origin and they were furriers. But young Norbert, he was given a violin to play with and he knew he wanted to be a, a musician. One thing, he said, most little boys, they want to be, they say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be an engine driver. And of course they don't. I knew exactly what I wanted to be, and I was, and he became you know, a, a, a great musician. As a youngster, he was uh, trained well, he was uh, educated, he, he had lessons with the great um, violin teacher Karl Flesch when they came to England after the, the Anschluss. Uh, Karl Flesch, uh, had been living in London, and one of his pupils was Suzanne Rocha, the Hungarian violinist, living in London, later the wife of uh, Martin Lovett. Um, and also, through uh, Flesch, they met Max Rostal, 
who helped teach several of the um, members of the Amadeus. And indeed, Max Rostal's brother, Leo, had taught the young Anita Lasker. So there are links right across all that we're going to be uh, talking about. They began getting together. They met each other during the war. The three that I mentioned had all been interned in, in, in um, Prius Heath and then on, on the, the Isle of Man. But their first concert together was at Dartington, where they were put together and encouraged um, uh, by Imogen Holst. And Imogen said, look, you need to get together as a prophet. You're so good. Why don't I help set you up for a Wigmore Hall recital, which she did. And they called themselves the Amadeus rather than the Brining String Quartet and ended with the, the Beethoven Razumovsky uh, number three. And they were sensational. Everybody adored them and they became by far the best known and probably the most competent, able quartet uh, in, in England at the time. They traveled all around the world. I don't know how good your Cyrillic is, but you can see the word Amadeus and then underneath Norbert, Brynin, Peter, Shidlov and so on. They uh, worked together for nearly 40 years until uh, Peter sadly died in 897. There are another cross reference. We've just heard references to Ted Heath there he is and in the middle, between Norbert and Heath is, is, is Shidloff. They got honours from everywhere, honours, honour degrees, they all got OBEs, and they really had a most wonderful, hugely influential career. So famous that there were political cartoons about them in the newspapers. Do you remember in about 40, 50 years ago, there were all those hijackings from Florida, much in the news at the moment, to Cuba. And there was a wonderful cartoon in one of the national papers of a string quartet, can you imagine that now? And the string, the two, the pilot and his co-pilot were looking around and there were four strange guys walking up to the first class carrying heavy bundles, i.e. musical instruments. And the caption was, well, it's another, either another unscheduled stop in Cuba or that's the Amadeus String Quartet. Let's move on from Norbert Brynin, very friendly with Rao and, very, and, 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 and wonderfully photographed there by, by Peter. Musicians, we've heard mention of several of them so far. Uh, Martin Isser uh, on, on, on the rest, uh, on, on the left there. Um, he studied mainly with, when he came to England, with the mother of Ernst Gombrich, Leonie Gombrich, who was a highly competent pianist. He was a, he was a pianist himself, a uh, great accompanist of people like Janet Baker and so on. And he also worked with Britain's English Opera Group and with uh, Glyndebourne, as did Paul or Paul Hamburger. When I knew Paul Hamburger, he was the uh, BBC's chief uh, accompanist. He was on staff and then he became a, a, a producer of uh, BBC Radio 3 music programmes to some extent. On the right, uh, Anita Lasker, Anita Lasker Walfish, another of the Peter photographs. She's with us now, she's, uh, she's uh, 95 or so, studied, as I say, with uh, Leo Rostal, brother of Max Rostal, who helped the, the Amadeus, and of course, mother of the cellist, uh, Raphael Walfish. Um, lovely picture here of Paul Hamburger on the right by, of course, Miline Kosman, with her husband, Hans Keller, looking sort of over there from the top. Um, let's move on though to drama. Martin Eslin, we haven't heard much about Martin. Martin Eslin uh, was uh, born in Budapest, but was brought as a child to Vienna, brought up essentially in, in, in Vienna. Very, very versatile, many, many languages, read in every kind of language, cared about drama, but cared an awful lot more than that. Um, and he uh, studied at the Reinhardt uh, Seminar, drama had to get out, of course, uh, from Austria in the wake of the Anschluss, spent a year in Brussels where he had a film contract, came to England in 39, and fairly quickly with all these talents, and the languages and so on that he had, he got a job at the BBC. This is the beginning of the war, early war years, in the BBC's monitoring service because he could listen um, to their programmes and report on them. Uh, then he actually let, joined the German service in Bush House, uh, where one of his colleagues was the composer Bertolt Goldschmidt. And in fact, the 
two of them put together an opera, which was one of the nearly prize winners for the opera competition at the time of the Festival of Britain in 1951. He, when I knew him, he was uh, head of BBC Drama, where he followed Val Gielgud, brother of John Gielgud, his predecessor. And he was a hugely creative BBC entrepreneur. You know, we had, we had these Radio 3 meetings where the controller would be Stephen Hurst, Viennese refugee. Martin Eslin would be there, head of drama. Hans Keller would be there, all of them emigres, refugees to Britain, sitting around the table, and sort of pe little me, people actually born in Britain, knew far less about British cultural life and the range of it than people like uh, Martin Eslin um, and, and, and Keller and Stephen Hurst. It's the one on the right, I remember, rather than the sort of restful one taken by Peter there on the left. And he was, as I say, he was author of a book on Brecht. He brought Brecht to British audiences. He wanted to make a kind of national theatre of the air that would cross the cultural world he'd come from and the cultural world of Pinter and others he'd come to. And he was probably most famous as the author of, and indeed the, the inventor of the phrase, the theatre of the absurd. Uh, with, you know, Ionesco and Beckett and, and Jean Genet and so on. There he is in a studio, in fact, with with Beckett. And the third person I want to talk about and the area of the arts is one again we've already heard of quite a bit um, and that is Martin Eston's friend Ernst Gombrich. And it's the, um, you see the, uh, the photo there. Gombrich, the great art historian if you like, the, the, the um, refugee from, from, from Central Europe, becomes eventually the head of the Warburg Institute, the Warburg Institute, still to this day part of the University of London. Of course, the whole library, the whole institute was a refugee uh, from Hamburg. Gombrich, in interestingly, and many of the people that I've written about in my book about the Hitler emigres, was not a refugee. Gombrich came here to do research on art history. Uh, incidentally, you were saying that where did he live? His, his place is on Briardale Gardens. And you're quite right, it was just off, off uh, Finchley Road. Um, he, his mother, Leonie, the, the pianist we've heard about already, she had studied with Bruckner. And Gombrich, like Eslin, went and worked with the BBC during the war, the monitoring service. And there was an amazing day in 1945, uh, April 1945, when he overheard German radio playing a movement from a Bruckner symphony, the funereal movement from the Seventh Symphony, uh, and it was by Bruckner, whom his mother had, had known and worked with, and he knew that that was a sign of the death of Hitler. And it was he who, knowing this, immediately went and arranged for the news of Hitler's death to be telephoned directly to Churchill. After the war, Gombrich went back to the, the um, Warburg Institute. He was his director right through from the late 50s until the early 1970s. Uh, he was hugely creative. He had written, as I say, the most famous, probably the most famous book in the whole history of, of, of art, uh, the story of art, but a great deal else also, also about art and illusion. He had that capacity of so many of them, Martin Eslin among them, to be amazingly profoundly scholarly with an enormous range of expertise in music, in all the arts, in languages, in literature, Goethe and so on. And at the same time to be able to communicate easily and immediately to a mass audience, whether it was readership or lectures or whatever it was. Um, and his famous book, The Story of Art, begins with the most famous <laughs> sentence in all art history, probably as famous as the opening to Taylor Two Cities or Pride and Prejudice. His opening was, there is no such thing as art. There are only artists. And he, he a bit like his friend, the, the, um, the, the great philosopher, Karl Popper, there are the two of them are at the bottom there in the middle, with Gombrich on the right talking to Popper. They were absolutely against overall overwhelming Germanic theories, Hegelian, you know, um, 
art history had been sort of connoisseurship, provenance and so on, until people like Gombrich and his fellow art historians like Zaxel, people associated with the Warburg and so on, came and said, well, no, actually, we bring our own agenda to the art we look at. If I showed you two pictures and I told you that one was by Rembrandt and one was by my daughter, you'd know which one you thought was better even before you'd even looked at it. We bring our own agenda and everything, every theory is in principle falsifiable according to what you see and what you learn next. A principle that Popper of course brought into his philosophy. So let me kind of end with just a few words of summing up, if I may, what did all these people that we've heard about today bring to British cultural life? I think in many ways they brought a professionalization of British culture, certainly in philosophy, in art history, in, in the musicianship of the Amadeus or George Scholte when he ran the Covent Garden Opera House. They brang, 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 brought a kind of professionalization and a cross-cultural cosmopolitanism. The moment you read Gombrich or Popper or Martin Esslin, you're immediately crossing boundaries like Hobsbawm, the historian and so on. And yet, final comment, all of them, I met so many of them, all the interviews I did with them, by the way, for my book, The Hitler Emigres, they're all now lodged um, in the um, audio archives of the Imperial War Museum. So I was just re-listening to Esslin only this morning. Um, Esslin and all, they all were happy to be British wanted to be British. Eslin was saying, you know, I had to learn about cricket and I learned to wear a trilby hat and not a beret. Um, I was very thrilled to be based in the country that I only wished I'd been born in in the first place. But if I helped enrich and widen its culture, then so much the better. And I think Peter and his uh, background and his portraits of so many of these people did very, very much the same, and we're all grateful to Peter for what he contributed to our British cultural life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. I would like to finish with a few words. David Fordham and Pamela Todd Fordham were two of my brother's very closest friends. And when Peter died so unexpectedly, Pamela wrote a wonderful tribute to him. And I have asked permission and I won't read them as beautifully as she would have done. Um, and I'm not reading all of it, but I'm reading something that I think shows Peter as Alex has shown him so nicely. So just to finish off, I will read Pamela's tribute. We loved Peter, and he was so easy to love. Bright, brave, bold, funny, mischievous, mad, maddening at times, irrepressible all the time. Larky, lovely, loyal, generous. Peter was one of life's great enjoyers, and he took you along with him on the adventure that life presented. He had a lively curiosity, infectious enthusiasm, and a boundless, ability for friendship. He never kept people in compartments. Instead, he mixed all the rich layers of friends with one another. When he worked in London as a photographer, his clients became his friends, as they did in Istanbul, where he and Rebecca lived for the first year of their marriage. Peter didn't have builders or carpenters, he had friends. He knew their lives, their histories, and he made room for everyone. Unlike most of the rest of us, Peter never shed friends, rather he shared them, and they stayed for life. I'm sure a lot of people here today know each other only because of Peter. He liked food, he liked wine, music mattered a great deal, but above all, people. He was such a sociable man. His great gift was for communicating with people, and he could do this in a hundred different ways. He had a nifty line of sight gags and a real generosity of spirit. He spoke several languages, but if he didn't happen to know the one you spoke, it didn't matter. He could still make a connection, leave an impression, prompt a smile. Perhaps he spoke Peter, his own language, gestural, sympathetic, warm, 
humorous, and above all interested. He was often provocative. He could indeed be challenging, but life was always more exciting when Peter was around. He resembled in lots of ways his mother Claire, who fed you and loved you and remembered everything about you. This great router ripple of love washed over you and included you. Once you never forgot him. Once you met him, you never forgot him. He touched so many people and he brought out the best in all of us. And I will just finish by saying that I loved him and I was so lucky that he was my brother. Thank you. Andrea, Daniel, Alex and Ian, thank you so very much. I'm sure that everybody will share my feeling that that was both a wonderfully informative and culturally rich presentation or series of presentations, I should say, but also an intensely moving tribute to a very special brother, a very special human, human being. So thank you very much, Andrea, for responding to my suggestion that we should indeed pay tribute to him and indeed tell the world, show his wonderful portrait series, which we've had the pleasure of looking at in some detail today. Now, I'm hoping that there will be some more questions coming in. There have been one or two comments rather than questions. Um, I think probably given the very personal nature of today's event, if anybody would like to unmute themselves and share any thoughts or questions they may have with us, please feel free to do so. We'll just wait for a few minutes. Um, I'll just look through as we're waiting at some of the comments here. Um, yeah, so some neat love asked, and some of you may already have seen the answer. How many photographs did Peter take at a portrait session on average? And Alex filled us in on that detail. He'd shoot between seven and ten rolls of plus X, 120. Uh, so about 70 exposures. And Yona, I don't know whether you would like to unmute yourself and Tell us a little bit about your own family background and the connection to these extraordinary people. Um, Yona Yapu Krumholtz from Israel has commented that Gombrich was also in the monitoring service, something that Daniel, I think, picked up on, and also has added that Josephine Stross was my daughter when I was a young child. And Yona, as you can probably imagine, comes from a very interesting background. So I don't want to embarrass you, Yona, but would you like to say a few words more? Well, uh, just a few. Um, okay. Many of these people were people my mother, who was called Edith Hoffman Yapu, knew. Um, I didn't know much about Dr. Strauss, um, uh, but I remember her not as a very scary lady. However, I was very young. Um, I didn't know that she was connected with Anna Freud and so on. Uh, well, barely, but... Um, I do know that all these people knew each other and they were a fascinating circle. The Gombrichs were unbelievable people. Um, very, very warm. You, you really can't find anything to criticize. And, uh, well, that's about all I can say at the moment. And I Tell us quickly about your mother, very, very briefly, because she was quite a lady too, wasn't she? Well, she was of Czech origin, actually, but she grew up in Germany and uh, came here having just somehow got her doctorate in 1934, here, meaning England. Um, and she was, uh, after years of um, desperately writing all kinds of articles on exhibitions and on all sorts of different things in London, she did get a job at the Burlington Magazine, and she was there uh, from 30. Eight, I believe, to 1950, um, when Benedict Nicholson, uh, who had been there for several years, probably wanted to just take it over completely. And anyway, she left. She then had a very peripatetic life, traveling in the footsteps of her husband, who was an Israeli diplomat, and ended her life at 108 in Jerusalem. So that was only four years ago. So thank you, Yona. Yet another example of this incredibly resilient and creative and quite extraordinary generation. Sure. So, you know, all these people, it's amazing. Do you remember her, Yona? Would you like to say a little bit about her? She was an extraordinary woman, was she not? Well, I do remember visiting her, and yes, the house had enormous atmosphere. Um, and uh, But I don't remember her well enough to really add what people have said, but I do also remember Meline and uh, Ines Schlenker, if she's watching today, who of course has recently written a book about Meline, 
Um, and uh, well, that's about it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Yona. Perhaps thank I can just chip in very briefly again in a very personal way to say that as a young pipsqueak of an art history student, I was invited, I think with my parents, I think with my mother, the photographer Dorothy Boehm, to visit the Gombris for dinner, I think it was. And what I remember most vividly about it is the way that he was utterly unpatronizing, uncondescending, you know, there I was, or whatever age I was, a tender age for sure, and he spoke to me like an equal. That was a rather wonderful and cherished memory. Uh, as for Marie-Louise, I did meet her um, in the, you know, when would it have been? In the 1980s when I was working on the first project that really was quite pioneering, though I say it myself, in this country. It was an exhibition called Art in Exile in Great Britain, 1933 to 1945, and what was wonderful as a junior uh, person involved with that, you know, I had the chance to meet so many of these wonderful people. And Marie-Louise, I remember again in this rather dark but imposing uh, house in Chester's Chesterford Gardens, again in Hampstead, Hampstead again, um, and, you know, tall, imposing, a handsome woman with tremendous dignity, a kind of quiet dignity. And what I particularly remember is the extraordinary uh, series of pictures she did over a period of some years of her aging mother. I mean, a remarkable, uh, empathetic kind of expressionistic, beautiful, beautiful series of, of works. Let me just check if there are any other questions coming up or... Um, uh, right, yes, Nate Love again. How much retouching, this is probably this is for Alex, was done on his, on his portraits, dodging and burning? Um, I can absolutely talk about that. A very little. Peter's um, ma mastery of exposure and development was pretty much perfect. So there wasn't, like you see these sort of rather heroic diagrams of some pictures that have got sort of plus a stop, plus half, a, plus a third just on this little bit. Peter, that didn't really happen. Peter would, um, he would make a print. It would be pretty much made in camera. There certainly was no retouching because that wasn't possible. Um, I mean, there may have been some spotting, but actually the way Peter worked, there was very little spotting because there was no dust. And uh, I, I can say they, they were, uh, they were very, always very easy because he had a way of processing his film, which made the printing easy. It, that, that, that was a normal thing. You know, I mean, it was just normal that you would print like that. So, so, so they are, they, the, the only, all difference that he may give to some, he may crop just a little bit, um, just to, 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 but most of it was done in camera. And we would have taken Polaroids beforehand of the setup, so there wasn't too much to think about. And, um, but the only thing that, that may have changed anything was he may have selected a different grade, uh, but I think they were mostly between two and a half and three, and, and that would be, that would go for all of them. And, yeah, I, you know, sort of cut my teeth printing them. So it was, it was, and I refer back to what I was saying about the lith printing that had its own, um, it, its own way of, 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 of process. And so you, um, again, not retouching, it was just a way of making the prints that, uh, that, that came out in a sort of rather lovely textural way, but definitely, uh, very, very, very easy, easy printing, I would say. Thank you, Alex. And another question, in fact, from Alex to the assembled company. Does anybody know, I mean, there was Wolf Sushitsky, a wonderful, another wonderful photographer, part of the lives of the people we've been talking about? Andrea, was he somebody you had any encounters with? Um, no, I got to know Wolf when I went to the Austrian Cultural Forum and it was a wonderful friendship and he was just the most wonderful of human beings and I was so honoured to know him and um, we, did ex we did an exhibition of his at the Austrian Cultural Forum and um, yes, another fine, wonderful, um, honest, open man with no... Um, I don't know what the word is. Um, he was just honest and straight and, and great. And uh, I loved him very much, actually. Thank you. Now, are there any other people wanting to ask or comment? Otherwise, we'll begin to round off. Last chance. <laughs> Perhaps I can just again chip in with a few observations. I'm uh, Yona. Oh, actually, hold on. All right. Let me go to Yona again. Um, Yes, a question to Alex. What was the film format? These are technical questions. What was the film format you were describing? It's a 120 roll film. Um, I don't have any here to hand. Miro, can you, can you grab me a 120 negative? Um, and um, 
uh, yeah, they're, they're, it's a large, it's four times larger than 35 mil. And it's, it's sort of halfway, it was Peter's favorite sort of format, really. And uh, he, he knew how to manipulate it better than any. Uh, and it's just quite a sort of, um, it, it, yeah, I'm going to show you some if you want some, uh, a second. But it was just, it was a, um, oh, right. Well, yeah, I mean, roll film that looks like this. Was there any in the, you know, so that sort of film. So, you know, and you could get about 10 exposures on the six by seven format. So six centimeters, his negatives are six centimeters by seven centimeters, which is one of the nicest uh, formats you can imagine. If you imagine, it's just, it's just off square and, uh, uh, and, and really lovely to work with and to compose in. <laughs> Thank you. So yes, just just to kind of ruminate, if that's the word. I mean, I, I'm struck from the very beginning of my work on the Inside of, Outsiders Festival, but increasingly as time goes by, by the remarkable interconnections, the networks of friendships and relationships that, that, that emerge, you know, as one delves into this rich cultural terrain between remarkable individuals. So, for example, just picking up on some of the names that have been mentioned today, Gustav Del Banco, Roland Rausen Del Banco, as I think Andrea said, one of the pioneering Cork Street galleries beginning to specialise in contemporary art for the first time. He was, together with Henry Rowland again an emigre, Lillian Browse was not, but collectively they became Joseph Herman's staple. You know, he was their main artist, one of the most successful artists, and Joseph remained loyal to them for many, many decades. Uh, Sebastian Isep, together with Helmut Ruhrmann, absolutely transformed the face of picture restoration in this country. That's a whole other area. And the fact that he was married to a very talented and important music teacher, again, is a reminder of the intensely cultured milieu, not just in one art form. I think, uh, Daniel, you'll agree with me there, won't you, that, that these people were, were, were operating in. Uh, internment, Pak uh, Dachinga, really interesting. I should mention that in the course of the online events that we've put on under the umbrella of Insiders Outsiders from June up to now and beyond, there have been quite a few uh, very interesting <coughs> sessions on the internment of so-called enemy aliens on the Isle of Man. So I would urge you, if you go to the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, they've all been recorded, they are there for you to enjoy in your own time. And indeed, the last uh, two events of the current series of online events on the 4th of November next week, Week, both of them relate to internment. Again, a very, well, actually morally murky, but actually very fascinating and culturally rich kind of area. Uh, Milan, yes, go on. Uh, Daniel, oh, carry on. Your, your, your whole point about the interlinks mm -hmm. is a wonderful mm -hmm. story that Popper, the philosopher, mm -hmm. wrote a letter to his friend Ernst Gombrich, the art historian, and he said, oh dear Ernst, uh, I'm so glad you managed to dig up that, that, uh, that letter that we got from poor old Einstein. And when you think of Einstein and Popper and the art historian, all three of them were happiest when playing music or listening to music. And it wasn't what any of them did professionally. Mm, indeed. <laughs> music is a, a lovely link there across boundaries. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Relatively but speaking. I'm, I'm aware. I mustn't go on too long, but I just want to pick up on one thing that should stop one in one's track slightly. Um, Andrea, I remember when we first met, I spent a lovely few hours in your home talking some time ago now, but you told me a rather wonderful anecdote, which I always repeat to other people, I hope, with your blessing, and that is that your father, not being Jewish, he wasn't, his life was not in danger at the hands of the Nazis. He chose to leave because he couldn't bear what he was seeing happening in Central Europe, in Austria in his case. And am I right that he was actually asked to work for the Nazi regime for the Third Reich. And he very memorably said something along the lines, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm booked up till the end of the Third Reich. And you know, what a wonderful, am I, am I right? I may have got that slightly garbled, but I think, you know, the, the, the well, this, is, this, is, this is a family story. Yeah, yeah. So it was apparently yeah. Goebbels wrote to him in England to say, would they do a tour of Germany? And he wrote to say, so the story goes, that um, he was fully booked until the end of the Third Reich. <laughs> but I've just discovered, rediscovered a wonderful letter he wrote to his father in 38 to say that he cannot bear to stay. And um, it's a long letter and I won't go into it now, but it, it says it all to me in the end. And he just had to go. 
because he described to his father very carefully what was happening, what was happening to people they know, knew, um, how people they knew were behaving, and what was being done to others that they knew. And um, he was lucky, he was able to leave with Egli Lund, he went to Denmark, and then he and landed in, in the UK before having his interesting time in internment. Mm. So a full and interesting life. And I just want to say one more thing, that when I went to the Austrian Cultural Forum, which to me was just so wonderful, um, my mother said, you actually get paid for doing this. Um, the, my, my roots suddenly returned to me and new links were made through the people I'd known, for instance, through Paul. And um, I, I love the way these threads carry on and I just hope they do for a long time. And I think Monica, what you're doing would encourage that to happen. Thank you. And thank you everybody. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna say one last thing and then we will call it a day. And that is the next, if you have the stamina and the time at 7.30 is another event I already mentioned at the beginning. Also a fascinating and far too little known female photographer called Lelia Gur. And actually there are strong music connections in her work. She photographed many things. So I do urge you, as I say, if you have time, if you have energy and inclination, and there are, I believe a few places left, uh, do, do sign up if you're so, uh, so inclined. Thank you very much once again to all our participants. Many thanks coming through the chat. I will uh, send the participants a, a record of what's been uh, typed in there and thank all of you for being here and good night. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ian. All the thank best. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. <laughs>